we're already off and running. Um, I think we should take it from that point, actually. But let's just start by saying hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the first The Good, The Bad and The Rugby of 2021. I hope you had a good Christmas. I hope you had a good New Year. Um, I hope you're locked and loaded and ready to go for, well, let's hope it's a better 12 months than the last. Um, my name's Alex Payne. It's lovely to be back with you again. Um, we have got a stellar list of guests over the next few weeks. Um, before we introduce our, our guests, to kick us off into a new year. Hask, how are you? You're back. Yeah, good, good. I'm all right, Great. actually. Yeah, it was all right. Um, you know, we obviously, uh, usually we were making podcasts of the good, the bad, and the rugby all the time, and there was sort of a bit of a gap. There was a moment in the week just after Christmas where I thought, you know, I thought wistfully of you and you and Tins. Um, it was good, actually. I, I actually had a really nice, nice Christmas. Um, ate and drunk what I wanted, which was, which was brilliant. Um, lot of Christmas movies. Went through the entire catalogue of Christmas movies, um, even, you know, and I discovered a new one, my favorite, Miracle on 34th Street, the original, oh, mate, what a classic. And then New Year's was just very, very chilled. And now we're back up and running again. It's like, um, every, I think everyone thought when the clock struck midnight, that it was just gonna be a whole new world. Like everything's gonna happen. We'll all be out, the disease is gone, the virus is gone, we're back. <laughs> It's business as usual. Uh, things <laughs> things are more tight than ever, um, you know. But I, look, it is what it is. We're going to deal with it, and hopefully, we'll bring a bit of humour as we as we go along. Lock the door and throw away the key. I'm not sure any of us are going anywhere in a hurry. Um, and actually, I think this could be a lot of fun over the next hour or so because already we haven't even started rolling yet. You two have compared broken fingers, lids, <laughs> bendability in post match in post rugby careers. It is a very very warm welcome. I'm going to say to a man who retired suddenly in October. It certainly felt that way. But um, at the age of just 32, 83 caps for the Wallabies, the 79th Australian skipper, and one of the world's very very best players in the last decade or so. It's a very warm welcome to David Pocock. How are you? Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on here. It's very nice to have you on. And it's really nice to have two old sparring partners, um, you know, brought together to have a bit of a chat post-rugby. Where are you in the world at the moment? How have you been? What's keeping you busy? And what's on the to-do list? I'm at home in Canberra. It's, uh, we were talking before we started, it's been a bit of a strange year, spending so much time at home. I don't think my wife and I have ever <laughs> had this much time together, but... Um, yeah, so far so good. I kind of gone back and done a bit of full time study, trying to finally finish some sort of degree. Um, so that's been keeping me busy. What What are the exercise books at the moment? What are you What are you studying? I'm doing sustainable agriculture, so I've been going really slowly, like one subject semester <laughs> since who knows 2012 or something. <laughs> feels like it's time to finish. <laughs> what I love Alex, about this, uh, uh, you could not find two more contrasting per personalities <laughs> post well, well, actually, actually, I've done a few courses. It's just that when, like, when David, you get offered this thing where they, I'm always about developing yourself outside of rugby, and they go, would you like to do a university course? And I was like, yeah, I'll do an open university course. How long is it going to take? 15 years. You're actually all right. You're actually all right. I probably <laughs> don't think I need to do it. But I say to, say to David off, because obviously, when you're a rugby player and you've got misses and everything else like that, there's sort of, however much they miss you while you're away, there's sort of a nice routine where you know you're going to go off and tour. But when you're finished, there's that, that, none of that break. And so David said that every time he goes out, his missus keeps bringing his boots back, packing his bag for him. Like, hey, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. So it's, it's, it, is a weird, it is a weird turn up when you've been doing that for so long. And I think as, as the podcast progresses, I think it'll be interesting to see how, like, how David has, has, has found retirement because you when you're playing you have a nice kind of balance of where you know what you're doing but then you have other areas and obviously David has an amazing amount of stuff that he's done elsewhere but suddenly when you're left completely to your own devices it is very odd to see like how to balance that what's your routine like we were talking off off there about training you know where we, we're going to cover his you know his kind of amazing attitude towards training obviously a fantastic physique if I go on to, to Instagram one more time someone's posted a David Pocock photo absolutely shredded passing I, you know every time I see it it stresses me out I have to go and I was going to eat some carbs but then I don't go and eat some carbs um, so it's interesting to see what those how you train for those for those goals but I'm excited to find out all about it. You're looking very well you're looking a little more streamlined I think than, than people might have have seen you last time out I mean how, how are you how is the body and, and how are you feeling? I'm feeling good um, sort of having to come to terms with some aches and pains and yeah, find ways to, to work with them and, and work on them. Um, I can see James chuckling, but yeah, feeling good. I, I, I think I've lost a few kilos, but I actually haven't weighed myself since I left Japan in March. So 
I need to either buy a scale or go somewhere where I can uh, jump on one to see uh, see how I'm going. Or just welcome to to the Fat and Happy Club and just ignore it forevermore. <laughs> um, I said, you know, because he's lost it. Because he, when he turned on, I thought Davis had gone for a straw streamlined. Like lids come off. I was like, oh, brilliant. I said, but I said to him, what, you know, what, what taught me through this? Just a bit of like a summer vibe, just streamlining for lockdown, easy maintenance. He was like, no, no, it's, it's, it's gone. And I don't remember him ever having thinning hair. So if he feels like his lid needs to go, what am I doing with this? That's like all, th- all throughout my career, all throughout my career, I was like, oh, what's David Pocock doing? So I'll, probably try, I'll try to do that. Now, now he's got his lid gone. I'm like, shit, do I, is he, is he pulled the plug too early? But he said in his own words, it's actually more difficult to maintain. So I'm quite oh, happy really? with this sort of, yeah. But I think, I think you've got the height. Like no one's, you know, no one's really looking down on your head at, at any yeah. point. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm not quite that tall. So it, uh, it certainly felt like it was getting to the point where, um, yeah, this was, this was the easier way to go about it. But yeah, as I said, it's actually a fair bit of work. So we'll have to see, it see if it goes back. You go faster in the swimming pool, I'm sure. So t- tell us, I mean, oh, you mentioned Japan in March. Tell us, you know, t- tell us why, why you've decided to put the boots away and how easy the decision was to make and whether you're missing it at all. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that you, you know at some point you're going to have to retire. And it's... It felt like it had been, you know, coming for a while. I I I thought about it. I didn't want to be someone who kind of pushed too long. You know, stayed stayed too long, and either you know got to the point where someone had to tap me on the shoulder and say, "Listen, mate, um, you know, actually, it's uh, it's time to give it up, or or for my body just to give up." So yeah, coming back from Japan, I think we were six rounds in when when the season got cancelled. Um, with a bit more time to think about it, just realize that yeah i think it was a good time to it was a good time to end it it certainly wasn't the the ending you you kind of think you'll have or or maybe imagine but that's how it goes it's uh yeah really feel like i've i've got a huge amount out of it and and i've loved my time in rugby and yeah and you need to find other ways to to contribute and and um yeah see what else is out there We'll come on to that in a moment or two, but I mean, are you, I, I, have you found other ways to scratch the itch of permanent competition and venting physically in, in, in that sort of sporting environment? Have you found a substitute? Are you looking for it? I certainly haven't uh, taken up MMA yet, <laughs> um, but yeah, I've kind of been enjoying not having kind of that schedule and being told, you know, where you've got to be when um having a bit more free time uh but that's also been a challenge i guess you your whole life is is um kind of run for you uh in many ways and there's a real rhythm where you're peaking for every every game on the weekend and have a bit of downtime then you're kind of back into it whereas um yeah now it's it's really trying to figure out well, what do I want to do with my time and yeah physically I've, I've enjoyed the break I've watched I've watched a few I haven't watched a lot of rugby this year but I've, I've watched a, a few of the Wallabies games and uh, certainly not missing it um, not missing it yet um, I don't think that'll change but who knows uh, there, there is there are certainly things that you you miss about having I guess so much time with people that you respect and really challenging yourself you know almost on a, a daily to to sort of get out of your comfort zone at training and and you know learn something learn something new but um yeah there's certainly other ways you can do that there was a huge there are a huge number of tributes for you and rightly so when, when the time came out actually Hask, you sent a really nice message I, what i've what i've loved watching actually as great players come to the end is it's sort of how you join a, a it's one club post rugby as opposed mm. to you're, you're so tribal when you're in it and has you, you sent a lovely message and it it sort of turned into a really nice sort of bromance between the two of you I mean look I'm always one of these people that um you know when I played I'm never uh, you know when you put the shirt on you're obviously competitive I was I was competitive in training but one of the things I, I loved about rugby and playing around the, around the world and doing different stuff was actually getting to meet 
the players opposition because I think life's about people sport is about people as much as it is anything else and I know some people are so kind of tunnel vision and they're there to do the job and but I always wanted to go meet people so I'd always try and find people after changing room and, and I can see the lot of people like David see me coming like who the hell is this fucking guy like what's he what's he doing please please don't come over and talk to me but I would I would really enjoy that and obviously you know I felt like I wanted to reach out even though I didn't know you that well we'd spoken a couple of times after after games and I think one of the things I always tried to do was get to know the players and I always like personalities. Like I wanted to see, you know, see what people are actually like because you have a persona sometimes on a field, but you don't necessarily get to know them. I, I share a lot of your views about, um, you know, LGBT plus community, all this kind of stuff. And I, and I, you know, I know you've been really outspoken and I admire people who are true to their convictions. It's quite a rarity for someone to actually be very like, this is what I believe in. I'm going to say it. And even if it ruffles a few feathers, um, and, I, and I was actually saying to Alex, I wondered, now you've had a bit of time to rest, do you think, like body-wise, if you had, had a bit more control, and I don't know if you did, but if you had a bit more control over how much you train, how much rehab, the, or the medical stuff around you, could, you, could you have played on longer? Or was it mentally you just didn't want to didn't do it? Because I look back now, and some of the things I've looked at, some of the things I've discovered some of the treatments I've had, I genuinely believe that I could have, I could have played at least another year, not forcing it, but I could have played if I, if I trained smarter, if I'd been allowed to have a bit more independence. I don't know whether you, you feel the same. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I definitely had a, another year or two in me, um, but yeah, really just felt like it was, it was time to, to move on. That, that, you know, there's other things that started to feel urgent and you know i think you you get to the point where you yeah you kind of just know that your energies have have moved elsewhere there's there's um other things yeah that that, that i feel like i want to want to get stuck into and and as i said earlier like it felt like i was at the point where i would just be i don't know just pushing it too far kind of just potentially not playing for the right reasons. I was, I was, you know, someone who's always kind of told myself that when I stop enjoying it as much and don't have that kind of real hunger to try and be the very best player I can be, then it's, it's time to, it's time to move on. Um, and I think I'd, I'd got to that point. I really like your point about um, how interesting it is to actually chat to players and kind of see behind the persona like whether it's their on-field persona uh or kind of what you're seeing on social media um yeah it is it is it is so interesting and, and i've really enjoyed getting to, getting to know guys who i don't know the public probably have a totally different perception of um and yeah i guess you you're definitely someone who kind of tried to get around and actually chat to people and you know i know in the australian team you you were known as someone who was always up for a always up for a chat and not kind of you know one of those staunch people who didn't want to didn't want to bar of anyone after a, after a game yeah, because i think i think it's interesting that and, and i don't know where it, it came it came from it, was, it, it i think it came from my dad really um and just in terms of he always taught me to kind of embrace embrace and maximize every kind of opportunity and mm. you know i think a lot of times in life you will have you will have met people that disappoint you or people that um you know you think you're going to be one way and they're completely different i you know for all the way i've done stuff on social media all the stuff i've done other things i've always kind of been judged a bit like marmite you either love me or veggie might you either love me or you, you, you hate me and i kind of i don't mind that because i am myself all the time and it, mm. but it's interesting going around with players like i I've met, uh, I would always go into changing because I want to see, like, you know, you hear, you see how someone trains, you see how someone performs, you know, to be a top international, to be consistent and to, to play the way for you, you play, for example, there's a lot of hard work and dedication and time that goes into that. What I always want to have is, is it matched up with a, a personality with someone that you, has got something else about him. Because, you know, life is, it, life in so many aspects is about you as a person, not necessarily about how good you are. There's plenty of players you'll play with who are unbelievable. But then you think, right, you take them out of this situation and put them anywhere else, how, are they going to sink or swim? And nine times out of they're ten, they're going, to, they're going to sink. Yeah, they're not going to, not going to be able to do that. And, yeah. you know, I, I could see that. I'd walk into a change room and, you know, it, it wasn't even a fanboy because I, I wasn't even, 
you know, it wasn't like that. It was sort of more of just like, like you said, can I see behind the curtain? What's the story? Because you, because we also now in, in sort of 2020 or 2021 now, we pick up snippets of things. You read a headline, you see this, you go, oh my God, I can't believe that guy said that. And then when you look at the full article, the full picture, it's nothing like the media have portrayed. So um, I always tried to, always tried to do that. And it was actually quite exciting because some boys would like, oh, head down, I'm not going to go in the change room. I was like, that's, I, that's why I love playing at the Highlanders is because when or lose, the Kiwis just walked into every other one's change room, sat down and have a bit. And I would be like, oh, this is what rugby's actually about. And I think we've lost the yeah. way a little bit um, in, in some of that. Yeah, there was some, a few years ago here in Australia, there was some criticism of players after a loss, kind of smiling and joking with, you know, people from, players from the, the, the other team. And it's, yeah, it is, it's kind of this, it's such a short-sighted view where because you potentially know someone, have a relationship with them outside of rugby, you can't have given absolutely everything, wanting to, you know, rip their head off in a game and then the whistle blows and you're catching up with them because you haven't seen them for six months. Uh, it's like this, this disconnect where, yeah, people particularly, yeah, I guess, particularly when you lose, they want to, you've got to feel it, you know, you, if you, you, you need to be hurting and it's like, listen, mate, like <laughs> no one's put more, more into this than, than us. Like we've, we've done everything and we fell short when you, when you kind of step away from the game, I, well, I certainly have been reflecting on like in the scheme of things, it is totally inconsequential. Like, I mean, really, if you, if you think it's a, it's a sport, um, <laughs> it means nothing, but at the same time, it's, it's amazing. You know, the, the opportunities I've had, the, the, the space it allows so many, um, young boys and girls to learn about themselves, be part of a team, all these, all these great things. And then, you know, to see the meaning that people get out of being able to support a team, um, and have that kind of connection to something bigger than themselves that brings a whole bunch of people together. That it's, it's really special. And I think having that perspective is pretty hard when you're kind of in the, in the thick of it. Um, so looking back, I probably wish that I was, yeah, more of a player who would, you know, go into the opposition's change room and, um, you know, seek out the opposite number and have, have a good chat. Um, I was probably too focused on, yeah, I don't know, recovery and, and sort of seeing, seeing what, what needed to be done in, in, in our change room. But I think we're taught that. I think we're taught that from an, from an early age because I, you know, I, when I was at Wasps um, early on in my career, you know, one of the things that Warren Gatland and Sean Edwards and these guys had was they wanted you to train incredibly hard on the field and held you to those highest of standards but then they wanted you to enjoy yourself off it. And I think I'm lucky because I was in a changing with lots of characters who wanted to do that. So when I came through the game, I never lost sight of the fact that A, we were really lucky to do what we did. I think exactly what you're saying is that sports in general, professional sport especially, more often not gives you life skills that other people in life don't normally get. Unless you've got a very good corporate business team where they're trying to instill different things in with you and they understand it. We're almost ahead of the game in certain aspects in terms of dealing with criticism, putting ourselves in a difficult place, um, you know, uh, dealing with loss, failure, uh, all the emotional elements, you know, actually really working hard. You know, all you have to do is go into a public gym and see someone who thinks they're training hard and you're like, you don't know training hard. You don't know a bit of suffering. You haven't, you haven't done that. And then when, when people often join these kind of like CrossFit boxes or join these kind of training things, where like even F45s and someone goes in and smashes them for 45 minutes, they're like, this is the best thing ever. And it's like, well, no, you're actually working hard. You're testing yourself. You're seeing what, seeing what you're about. And I think rugby taught you all those lessons, but also it opened doors. We traveled around the world. We got to meet people. Uh, and I think the one thing is that every, every day was an opportunity to really embrace it and, and enjoy it. And I think that's what I worry about now is sort of the younger players is just because the media and people who have never done it think that you should have your head, head in your hands, you should be tearful, you should be you know, beating your chest, you should be like that guy out of um, you know, Da Vinci Code with the thing on his leg, like cranking it up every time he's done something wrong, putting the spikes in. It, it doesn't work like that. And it's very hard because the populist opinion is, oh, so-and-so wasn't high-fiving. But I, I knew that I could be as professional as I wanted, but it still meant that I could have a, 
I could have a chat with someone and speak to them afterwards and actually get to know them because it's, it's nice. And I never felt that if I had a chat with you or I had a chat with Rich or I had a chat with you know, Sergio when, you know, when I was playing, that I was going to suddenly not want to fill them in on the field. That was never, never a problem because you're a competitive animal. You don't suffer every day to some respect to then suddenly go, oh, it's David, have a little tackle, have a chat. Like, you know, what I would normally do if I play against someone, I'd fill them in, hit them, and then they'd go, you're right, has to be like, yeah, good, mate, you're right, and then get or just run off to the other side of the field. Um, yeah. And I think that's what, uh, that's what makes rugby great, and hopefully that some of the younger players will still understand that, and I worry now because they are just such like robots, and they don't realise that you can do that. And I think it's important, especially for me when I talk to younger players, is that... Um, they understand that they can still enjoy what they do because we were quite lucky. We got a long, a long career out of it. You know, some people, it's a short lived thing. And before you know it, you're back in that real world where, you know, it's a, this, it's a different place. David, can, can I ask you a quick question, which is you said you really enjoyed getting to know people who you otherwise wouldn't have done. I mean, if Hask is the fairy at the top of the Christmas tree of misunderstood <laughs> rugby players, who else over the last six months or so have you had a conversation with you know who who otherwise you just would have been like ships in the night who you know who have you enjoyed getting to know that you never thought would have been um you know an ally in japan i was with um panasonic and uh, sam whitelock and damien dialande were, were both there and, and that was yeah we, we had a great time it was it was really good getting to know them and, and kind of sort of almost comparing notes um I guess Sam and I are kind of same age, have been around national teams for a similar amount of time. He's played a, a lot more tests than me. But it was, yeah, it was interesting to kind of, yeah, in, in some ways sort of talk shop and kind of see the different different approaches between Australia and New Zealand. And, and um, but then, yeah, we also just get to get to know him and learn about his, yeah, farming in New Zealand and, and the things that, that make him tick. Um, and then with Damien, I guess after the World Cup, um, hearing a bit about journey and just how they how they did it, like it, it, it sounded like a pretty special, pretty special time for them. I think the whole way through the tournament, they they seemed to be really building and had a yeah had a sort of a belief that you, you kind of watch the final and and it it makes a lot more sense now. Having having sort of spoke to him and then caught up with a few other. Uh, the South African players over there. I, I really want to get into your story because it is it is one of the more extraordinary of of modern modern rugby players. Um, I suppose to sort of do that, what you, you you also said a while ago um, you felt it was time to move on from rugby because you wanted to put your energies into something new. What is your what is your focus today, tomorrow, for the next few years? Well, I'm I'm really interested in how we can. Um, I guess as as everyday Australians or your you know people who aren't the government start to deal with um, climate change and and stuff around the biodiversity crisis, the the extinction crisis that we're we're facing. And I've been involved in some conservation projects over the last decade or so. I've been involved in some community development stuff in Africa. Um, as well and over the last few years have been really trying to develop a model um and and we hope to trial it in a in a in a area in zimbabwe where you're basically trying to help people who are living alongside wildlife that we all say we should be looking after and conserving how do you actually get them to benefit from it um at the moment some of the world's poorest people bear the cost of living next to, you know, elephant and lion and all these all these species that we we love watching on on uh, Attenborough's um, shows, uh, but they don't really benefit from it. And there's a bunch of people working in this space. I'm certainly not inventing anything new, but it's I don't know, it's just something that interests me. So uh, I've been putting together a project um, in Zimbabwe for the last few years, and, and yeah, we'll be heading over there this year to get stuck into that. Where did, where did your love for like animals come from? Because like, I know obviously you, there's so many things you're passionate about, but well, like, where, did, where did this like, massive, I know you obviously, because you, know, you were born in South Africa, weren't you originally? Is that right, Zimbabwe? No, which, which, where were you, which Zimbabwe. Where were you born? Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe yeah. 
Is yeah, that, um, you saw them outside your back door and just suddenly fell in love with them? Because I know you used to get bullied for walking around with a bird book. Is that right? <laughs> so I you used to have a bird book. Tucker. I mean, I, I, when, when I read it, when I read what you'd done, a bird book, I said, I've had a few bird books under my arm. But then it turns out <laughs> they were very, very different because you were walking, ticking them off. And I thought, he's walking around ticking off the birds. What a professional. Then I realised you meant actual. It's like ornithology, isn't Part it? That's Twitch, the yeah. Word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can only apologise, David. I can only apologise. Continue. Um, I, I grew up on a farm in, in the middle of Zimbabwe and I guess I feel really lucky now to have had a grandfather and a, and a, and a dad who were really like really into birds. Um, and I don't know, as a kid just found them so interesting. Like we had a lot of birds around the farm and, and, um, uh, you'd kind of get to, you'd get to know them, you get to know their calls. Um, you know, some would migrate down in summer, so you'd be really excited for them to to start arriving. Uh, and yeah, you'd be <laughs> you'd be trying to build up a bit of a list of things that you'd seen, and um, yeah, copped a fair bit of shit from my cousins and um, and my brothers at times. But I don't know, just found it interesting, so did it. Um, and I guess that's kind of something that I've. I don't know, it has been a bit of a, not an, not an escape, but I guess an, another somewhere else where I can, I've been able to get away from rugby um, and put my energy into other things. And I've, I've found that really helpful. Um, I think with, with, with my personality, I can get like pretty consumed about, about something. And I, I know early on in my, career when I was at the Western Force. Um, uh, yeah, it was sort of, I guess it's, it's, it's what's necessary to, to get to that, that point, that kind of obsession, um, whether it's, you know, gym skills, all those, you know, you're, you're 24 seven, you're kind of just thinking about rugby, living, breathing it. Uh, but realized in my early twenties, like that, it's not sustainable. And I, I didn't want that to be, my entire life. I certainly enjoyed a lot about it, but it, it, I think it takes a toll both on yourself and then certainly on the people, on the people around you, family and friends. Um, as an immigrant moving to Australia um, and sort of getting to know the, the, le the country here and kind of some of the wildlife, it's, uh, it's a pretty incredible place, um, particularly the bird life. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's special. Um, it's hard not to, uh, not to fall in love with it over here. So I've got a confession to make, right? Nobody knows. They know, everyone knows that I'm a bit obsessed with like diggers, you know, you know, diggers, excavators, JCBs. Oh yeah, like a bobcat. Uh, yeah, exactly like a bobcat. Yeah, yeah, right. So I had, I had in, in the UK, they had these books called I Spy, and they were I Spy, like I Spy tractors, I Spy diggers. You had a bird book. I used to have uh, an I Spy, like. The construction machinery and you drive on the motorway sit at the back of the car you'd be like oh have you seen this please take it off so <laughs> but you're into nature i was into and with that our last four listeners <laughs> leave the building <laughs> have so, you got this... your uh, have you got your ticket your license yes yeah i actually do you know what it was i went I, I, before, just before lockdown i was going to do my ticket on a different machine the 360 i was going to go to jcb quarry and and do it um to to get to get that one just purely my wife was like why do you want to do it and i said babe the only people allowed to work at the moment are construction people. If all else fails and the podcasting blows up, let's just get on the old, let's get on the digger. Um, <laughs> but but you, did you find though, like, like you said, how, because a lot of players at the moment don't have uh, things outside of them. So, you know, they, they do everything you're saying. They focus so much on it, on, on their sport and they have a real level of professionalism, like, but they don't have other areas of distraction. Did you find that once you, you harnessed that, uh, you know, the, the, the environmental stuff and the other things, you actually found that you had more balance and were probably better at playing and better at getting that life balance or, or you know, because a lot of people say it's a distraction, but I don't agree. Yeah, I, I think, you know, most guys have stuff that they're interested in and kind of working on the side. I think there is that fear that, you know, if I, if I spend too much time on this, it's going to distract from my rugby and, I don't know, you know, thinking back, like, I don't know what, whether it was a friend or, or how I sort of got to the point where I made a, like sort of a conscious decision where it was like, no, this stuff is actually helping me 
turn up to rugby and just being like pumped for training like i'm here like let's 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 do this um and then kind of trying to walk away from it which is easier said than done like it's um you know particularly particularly after a loss or, or you know something happens at training or whatever else it's uh it's not easy to do but i think for you know for your mental health and actually being able to turn up the next day refreshed and ready to go um it it really helped me and i think as it as i kind of got got better at allowing those other things to almost fuel my my rugby um yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm really grateful i did can I ask how much Zimbabwe shaped you as the person you are today? I mean, I've watched your, your documentary. I think, is it on Amazon Prime? I think it is. And it's so interesting talking to you because there are so many contrasts. A, a more dedicated professional rugby player you won't meet. And yet you're, you're totally not defined by being a rugby player. You know, you're an incredibly proud Australian wallaby. And yet it sort of seems your heart remains in Zimbabwe. And I just wonder how much your upbringing in Zimbabwe has has built the person you are well i think your your childhood sort of sets you sets you up and 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 really ingrains so many ways of thinking and ways of being so i think it it, it played a huge role i mean as a kid i had never ever thought about leaving zimbabwe um it wasn't wasn't something that i thought i'd ever do um i was a obsessed springbok supporter um just just love them um what were your what were your early memories of the springboks what, what was your who did you grow up watching the 95 um world cup is kind of my first memories of watching rugby and just how i don't know momentous it was from then it was kind of that that became my Sort of almost my goal and my drive was I was going to I was going to be there one day. Um, I was going to be at a World Cup. I was going to be winning a World Cup final. I became pretty like determined and, and obsessed about it from a from a young age. Um, you see, in the in the late nineties, uh, early two thousands, things politically became pretty unstable in Zimbabwe. Yeah, they ended up being a sort of a big. Uh, land reform pro program where you know a bunch of um, white and and black farmers got kicked off um, kicked off their farms and uh, we were one of them and and were pretty lucky in that my mum was a was a qualified teacher so could move to move to Australia on her qualifications. Um, that seems to gloss over a, a sort of a little bit of of the um, of the story really. I mean. Hmm. What do you remember of that time and the upheaval and the challenges and what you had to go through? Pretty confusing as a as a kid, um, growing up How loving. How old were you? Uh, I was fourteen when we left. I was probably eleven, eleven or twelve when things started to um, sort of get a bit dicey. Um, yeah, you know, loving a country and then seeing your president on TV kind of saying, you know, white people are uh, the source of all our troubles. They need to leave uh, all this kind of stuff. And then we had a, a couple of um, a couple of farmers in our uh, in our sort of farming district were killed. Um, and yeah, I guess it, it it does it does rattle you as a as a kid. Um, being confronted with with that stuff, I remember going to um, one of these sort of family friends of ours. Were um, the father and son were ambushed um, one night, and the the dad um, was shot and killed, and the son managed to uh, managed to survive. But as a kid, like putting our fingers, they were in their um, like Ute in their truck, putting our fingers through like all these bullet holes in the side of the car um yeah thinking back just pretty pretty bizarre um so that that certainly that certainly shaped i guess my my early years and, and arriving in australia i had a real i guess it was almost a sense of guilt like a lot of most of my classmates i'd left in zimbabwe didn't have the opportunity to move to australia things were, were still pretty bad um and 
I guess I just use rugby as my outlet and, and way to deal with all the change and upheaval and trying to process all the stuff that, that had happened. Um, so yeah, it, it very much became my escape and I'm pretty, I'm pretty grateful for it. Like it, it, it was, it was how I made friends. It was, it was kind of, uh, uh, my real focus through, through school. It is an extraordinary, it is an extraordinary story and, and very different to anyone else we've had on, on this show before. I, I just wondered, you know, as a family going through that, was it something that you discussed and you dealt with together? Was it something that as soon as you'd gone, you left it behind and, and focused on Australia? I mean, how, how did you get through that? Because it's, it's not just you and your, your pride in Zimbabwe. You, you know, you've, you, you come from a family with generations and, and deep roots in that country. And I just wonder how, I mean, did you literally up, up sticks and leave one night or was it, you know, six months in the planning? We did move off the farm kind of in a bit of a hurry um, one afternoon, but then we we're able to go back and kind of pack up and, and uh, moved into town for, for about a year and then, and then left. I mean, as a family. Do you, know, um, do you remember why you had to move one afternoon? Was it sort of word had reached you that if you didn't, yeah, we were kind dot, of just dot, dot. told to told to leave. Um, uh, did you? Did someone said that you you used to have like a security door as well that you had to sleep behind it? Because I, what I'm trying to get is just a sense of how like on edge and dangerous it was for people. Because I think you know sometimes you know you you saying your neighbours got shot like it was it was a, like a massive amount of fear, wasn't it? And a, a massive amount of uncertainty. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of that chronic fear and uncertainty that that I think. Um, wears you down and leaves you with 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 issues. Um, I guess as a, as a family, like you know, everyone's trying to deal with it as best they know how. Yeah, you know, everyone's experiencing it differently. We were certainly shielded from a lot of it by my folks. So yeah, the extent of it all, we we didn't um, really know at the time. Yeah, I think my folks tried to talk about it a bit, but it was yeah, it was it was sort of a real time of upheaval and and um you know looking back now like you know like most um immigrants um me and my brothers i've got two younger brothers we've kind of yeah we finished school year got on with it um we've got friends and are into into life it's uh it's the parents who kind of bear the the cost of moving in their what they would have been in their 40s um with literally a few suitcases and not having you know, now looking, looking at um, the older years with, with no savings or um, superannuation or pension. Yes, certainly grateful for the opportunities Australia has given me. And I guess, I guess it is that, that weird, that weird tension of sort of sense of belonging. Like wh where, where is home? Like I, um, really love going back to Zimbabwe and there's, there's things about it that just feel, um, feel like home. Um, but in some ways, Australia also feels, feels like home now. So it's, it's kind of grappling with that. And, um, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be good to spend a bit more time in Zimbabwe this year, but I, I certainly see Australia as home in the long term. Sorry, Alex, I was going to just ask you, you know, in terms of, said, of dealing with stuff, because it's it, like in, on reflection, obviously now you've matured, you've done your, your, your career. You know, what point do you realise this, this has affected me and, and, you know, like your brothers? Because there's a quote from your, your dad saying that the kids saw too much, it affected them greatly. Like, you, you can now look back, but a lot of people don't know they've got any problems until they either hit <laughs> rock bottom or, or something else. Do you know what I mean? Like most people are like, I'm absolutely fine. And then, and then suddenly someone goes, do you know what? Yours, I think from what you're saying, was obsessive, but how did you know how did you feel well um, one of my brothers um had some pretty bad ptsd uh when we moved to australia so it was like a outpatient in a hospital for about a year and um yeah it took him it took him a quite a bit of time to kind of get back on his feet and, and um and get on with get on with things so I guess you kind of, you, you know, it's there and, and, and yeah. I guess the thing that, the thing that, uh, I don't think I've ever talked about this, but the thing that got me to actually start to deal with it, I would have been in my early twenties and was just having heaps of nightmares, um, kind of kept waking me up. 
um, and they were all to do with, with Zimbabwe and, and oh, it just went on and on. Uh, and it got to the point where my wife, Emma was like, listen, you gotta go and you gotta go and see someone talk about this stuff. Um, and I'm really grateful I did. Like, I think, yeah, we've all got, uh, we've all got stuff that I think just in actually talking to someone, um, that's the, that's the start of kind of letting it out and then and, and making a bit of, a bit of peace with it, whatever it might be. As a culture, like we're not, we're not great at it. Um, you know, for men, you've got to kind of be this, you know, the warrior out there on the rugby field, not showing emotion. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely changing and it's a bit of a bit of a stereotype, but I think we've still got a long way to go for, uh, yeah, for men to be able to access their, their feelings more and to be able to talk more openly about it with their, with their mates or people who are close to them. Do you remember the gist of those dreams? I mean, was it real and, and sort of flashbacks or was it just a sort of a sensation? Oh, it was kind of a, a combination of both, like some, some real stuff with some, just like recurring, just some recurring scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. I won't ask you to, to, to lie down and, and tell me your, your dog. <laughs> yeah, <thoughts>. please don't. <laughs> um, what, what's extraordinary about this though, David, is, is given what you've been through, how your love for Zimbabwe remains. I mean, have you, have you worked that bit out? I oh, mean, I do, I do love the place, I guess. Um, I mean, there's so many great people there and there's something, there's something really special about, um, I don't know, the, the place, like it's, 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 if you ever get a chance to visit, I, I would really recommend, um, spending some time there, uh, beautiful landscapes, really friendly people. And, you know, like, I think like, like a lot of places, if you judged the whole country based on its politicians, um, it's probably, Are you talking um, about Zimbabwe or somewhere or, well, or the UK? <laughs> <laughs> well, most yeah. There's there's a there's a fair list of countries at the moment um, that that's true for. Beneath all the the shambles of of what happened, there's there's still so much goodness there. Do you remember going back for the first time? And did you go back on your own, or did you go back as a family? Or well, as soon as as soon as I had a contract and I could afford to actually fly back, I've kind of been back almost almost every year um and i think i i think i went back with a mate from school in brisbane um my mate morgan so yeah it was it was good and and i guess since then i've kind of reconnected with the, with a bunch of um people over there and and have yeah we we, we um partnered with a community development organization for about eight years um and did some what i think was was pretty good good work um in a sort of really poor rural community what did that involve oh man it was it was pretty it was pretty basic stuff to start start out with like it's like really basic maternal health um stuff so trying to get running water at health clinics um trying to get schools so that they you know had roofs and all those sorts of things um and then that kind of led into food and water security so so working with farmers on more sustainable ways of farming, um, using those kind of working groups as ways to discuss other issues in the community. Um, and then eventually moving on to sort of a, a value chain approach to livestock, which is kind of like, you know, you can, you can throw a bunch of money into um, a community helping fix the school, helping do this, helping do that. But if you actually help p people realize 300% more for their livestock, they'll actually spend, they'll spend their money on, on food, education, health. Um, so just trying to get the, the, the value chain working where people have access to markets and there's an incentive to, you know, look after livestock better and then actually get, yeah more 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 money back um so it was a great it was a great learning experience yeah i think like so many of those things at the start you kind of think oh i'm, I'm gonna go and you know help people and and at the end you feel like you've gained way more in terms of learnings and and uh 
a different perspective on life and and um yeah it, it was it was uh it was a great experience it is a remarkable story when when you talk about what you've done in Zimbabwe whilst running a career as as one of the greatest players of the modern generation really I mean can we explore a little bit how life developed in Australia I mean did you did you stick a pin in them I'm also interested why Australia not South Africa I'm not sure the UK we could have had I mean David just imagine the podcast you and I could have done if you'd come up here I would have been out of a job so (laughs) better than uh, than the junk we do with the guy on the right. I don't actually talk that much, so um, I don't think you want an introvert as your co-host. <laughs> you, know, you, need a, you need a big guy who loves, you know, yelling at tanks and... <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that's what, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that what, David, of all the things, that's what you've summed me up, is the loud, wide bloke who shouts at tanks. <laughs> I was like, he's, he's one of the greatest players of our generation. He's an inspiration, all this stuff. And there's a the big bloke with the fucking loud mouth who shouts at tanks and diggers, does he? Really, that's it. I did think that was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant yeah. skit. Yeah, no, I did, I did enjoy that. I, yeah, sorry, Alex, carry on, because, yeah. No, I was just interested. Yeah, I mean, why Australia, not South Africa? I'm not actually sure. I, th- I think after everything that happened, my folks were just keen for a sort of a, a fresh start and, but Australia it was. And was it, has it always been Canberra? No, I, I, we moved to Brisbane. So I finished, I did three years of high school in Brisbane. Pretty lucky in that I finished high school in 2005. And in 2006, the Western Force were entering the Super Rugby competition. And so, of course, they're looking for, a, you know, a whole new squad, um, mostly from the existing Super Rugby teams. Um, and there were a couple of, a couple of us that, that they sort of pulled straight out of school. John Mulvihill, um, who has been with Cardiff, um, mm. he was actually coaching one of the schools we played against. Um, and so, yeah, I pretty much finished school. Um, we did a tour of the, the UK and Ireland with the Australian school boys. Got back just before Christmas. And I think on the 1st of January, flew to Perth. And uh, kind of that was the start of um, professional rugby. Am I completely making it up? On that tour of the UK, did you, who did you, were you billeted with somebody? Yeah, we had a we had a midweek game against Munster. I mean, pretty much everywhere we stayed, we just got billeted out, and we were with the Murrays. And um, that's right. Yeah, Connor. He was a few years younger, um, but we actually want the. <laughs> it was. They, they were great hosts. Um, we had this, I think it was like a, a Wednesday game. Um, and then on the following Saturday, we played um, in Belfast against the Irish under 18s, I think it was. Um, and so I hadn't played the the midweek game. And when Mr. Murray came and sort of pick, picked me up and was taking us back the, uh, to their place, I said, listen, can you just drop me, you know, I don't know, eight Ks from home and I'll I'll run. And uh, so he let let me out and ran and got like totally lost. Like to, to the point where you, you know, this is like pre, you know, running with a phone or something. So I'm kind of just eventually just like walking through. It's kind of like a farmy, villagey area. Just thinking, shit, like what <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> like I don't have a phone number. I've got nothing on me. It's getting dark. Um, you know, I'd run past this, um, these people that were camped on the side of the road, being chased by an Alsatian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great training. So, so eventually I've just like, thought, oh, well, I'll just walk, you know, knocked on a door and said, listen, I'm extremely lost. I'm staying with the Murrays. Uh, like, can you help? And, um, yeah, luck would have it. She actually knew the Murray, so she called called them, and I wasn't actually too far from them. But um, I love your supreme yeah. confidence, though. I love you, like, yeah. Listen, I'm going to run by eight k before mobile phones, before GPS. You didn't have a map. You didn't have the phone number. You were like, I'll find this. Really? How are you going to do that, Liz? Oh, the old Zimbabwe Australian way out in the outback. <laughs> oh, the old like, Mick Dundee. Well, it, it, yeah, Mick Dundee. I mean, it seemed. It seemed pretty simple when, you know, the three or four times we'd been in, you know, you come down this road, turn right, first left, and you, you're there. But uh, on foot, it was slightly different. <laughs> and also, especially when you're getting chased by an Alsatian. 
Um, you know, that'll always, I just, I want to, I want to come back to the, cause the, 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 the approach to training, but can I just, cause obviously we, we've, we've gone sort of in different places. Your like early age, um, you know, was rugby like really part of your family? Because there's some great stories about you, you, you playing. I want to talk about your, 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 you know, your dad and the, the hundred more game, but did you always want to be a rugby player? Cause was rugby really part of your family? Yeah, it was a big part of, a big part of our family. Um, yeah, my dad had played, his, his dad had played, um, no, like on both sides of my family. Um, they went to rugby and, you know, the, the Springboks were just such a, I don't know, ev everyone went for them. And I think particularly that 95 World Cup kind of really, um, I don't know, really changed something. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's the whole way through primary school, I knew that I wanted to, you know, play for the Springboks one day. And what did that look like? Did that look like you guys, you know, did you tell your brothers, your dad this, were you, you know, were you, you playing rugby on the farm all the time? Because I know, obviously, uh, we had Sean O'Brien on, uh, another fantastic back row player. And he said when he was younger, working on a farm, you know, chasing the sheep, um, helped him with his footwork and stuff. I mean, have you got, have you got similar stories to that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think animal welfare would be after us these days. We we do a fair bit of sheep catching and, and sheep riding as as little kids. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I was I was pretty obsessed. Like we'd we'd kick the ball out in the in the backyard. I'd play with my brothers. Um, my dad coached the the high school in town, so I'd kind of finish finish our primary school training at 3.30 and then just hang around from 3.30 to 5 till they they had finished training and kind of just play around on the side of the field and hold hit shields and um, whatever else. And and I don't know, I, I always kind of felt as a farm boy that like I, I would never have admitted it um, as a kid, but I've kind of had it like had it over some of the some of the, the town kids. Um, and I was like, yeah, pretty big for my age. So did really well as a, as a young kid. And, you know, that kind of just is a self reinforcing thing where you, you're kind of getting noticed or getting praise for something and you, you, you want to do it more and get better at it. Were you quite a physical, like, were you physical? You know, like you watch young kids now when they, when they play and there's always like the big lump that just runs through everyone because no one can tackle. But then every now and then you see within a team that like, little mad bloke who just starts cutting people in half. Uh, were, were, you, were you that kind of person? The, I think the biggest, the biggest blessing I had as a young kid was I turned up for, you know, first day of training in grade three. And um, like, I think I walloped some kid. Um, and the coach said, listen, you're going and you're playing the rest of the year with the grade fives. Um, <laughs> So, you know, whilst I was big for my age, I was now playing two years up and yeah, really had to learn how to, and, and it just so happened that the age groups above my year were shocking. Like they, were, they, were, they didn't win a lot of games. So, you know, I just became a good tackler because that's all you did <laughs> was, <Is> it, <laughs> was tackle. Is it true? Cause, cause you know, is it true that mums complain? Cause Billy Vernapola, when he played at Harrow, Right, he, he, in his last year, when he was, he was doing some stuff with Wasps, he played one game, scored five tries, and I think killed, literally killed two people. <laughs> and the school were like, you can't, you can't play. I, I heard a great story that some mothers complained about you and were like, no, 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 no. He's, he's not allowed to come and fill our kids in. He's got to go, he's got to go somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I was, I was, pretty, I was pretty dark about it because it meant I didn't get to play with my classmates. I was always... Until grade seven, I was playing up, um, playing up a year or two. Um, but I mean, we all know, we all know those kids who you know were heads and shoulders above everyone else's kids, just ran ran sort of straight through everyone. And uh, as soon as everyone caught up, they had no skills. So yeah. um, <laughs> I think there's probably a lot to be said for kind of you know weight based. Um, uh, competitions like they like they do in New Zealand. How obsessive were you ab about your rugby? I mean, you know, I remember hearing something about 450 sit-ups a day and 2,000 passes a day off your left hand, etc. I mean, were you someone who was 
so focused on it that, that other kids found it curious, quizzical, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, it depends who you ask. I mean, in, yeah, I was, I was pretty obsessed. Um, and, but I guess also in a way, like a little bit em, embarrassed about it. Um, so I'd kind of try and, like I had this, I had this stupid thing where um, as a teenager, you know, I'd have to, have to probably from like 16, I'd have to do like 450 sort of sit-ups every day, um, regardless. It worked. It, it worked if that was yeah, idea. but it was so unhealthy. Like it got to the point where, and I was I was actually really I like, you know, we'd be on the. I, I gave it up thankfully. Um, I think when I was about 20, but you know, first year or two at the force, like I'd go into the the bathroom at night and like do my do my crunches because I didn't want my my roommate to roommate to see like I think it was it was less about rugby and it was more about trying to deal with I think a lot of the stuff that 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 like the trauma from Zimbabwe where uh in many ways like that was something I could control um mm. and whilst other things felt uncontrollable and scary like I can do this so I'm going to do it every single day um and it was really liberating to actually get to the point where I realized that I was like Shit, this is not actually this is not making me a better player. This is not making me a better person. Um, I need to find some sort of balance here and and uh, and give it up. And was that something you worked out for yourself, or was that part of somebody saying, "David, relax, breathe. It's all going to be all right." Thankfully, I actually had a friend outside of rugby who said, "Like, mate, this is this is not healthy for you. Like, uh, you may." Like you may think you can rationalize in your head that this is what's making you good, um, but it's not. Like you could, you, you'll be you'll be a better player if you actually put that energy into something else or or uh, allow yourself some rest. And I guess that's the that's you know that's the one of the big challenges is is knowing how hard to push yourself and knowing when you need to take the foot off the pedal and and you know have a bit of rest and actually look after your body you can kind of get this weird relationship with your body and, and I, I this kind of came to a head for me when, when I moved to Canberra and had two back-to-back -back, um, knee reconstructions mm. and you're kind of like you're you're blaming your body for, for letting you down but it's like hang on like this is the only body you have like you've really got to you've really got to look after it. It allows you to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, so the flip side of that is that that, that takes a toll and, and um, you know, being kinder to yourself and kinder to your body is often the harder thing to do than to just punch out though that last set or, you know, do that extra workout. It's, um, and I, again, like this is probably something that comes further into your career. Like early on, there's, just you just can't get it around there's no shortcuts there's there's no way around just working hard and there's days where you don't feel like doing it but you have to do it but i think later in your career it's getting to the point that that point where you know how much you need to do and and when you can um sort of rest up and look after your body more you know i i if it makes you any feel, feel any better obviously you know by the the the, the, the trauma i i went to exactly the same thing and it, and, it, and i and i look back now and the stuff that i used to do in terms of like i used to always be scared that i wasn't going to be fit mm. so it meant that i would always be doing extra fitness i had like tackle bags at home i'd make girlfriends who didn't have anything to come out and pass the ball with me i'd go to the local you know i had to do like i, I before games i was doing like a bodyweight workout in the in the um my, my hotel room before I went out to play. You know, I was, mm. at one point in the week, I was doing, I was seeing Margot Wells, a sprint coach twice. I was doing extra wrestling to help my tackling. I was doing weight three times a week. I was doing a fitness top up, plus all the normal rugby training, you know, and then I was coming home, I was watching tape of, 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 of stuff, and all this. And my friend, the guy called Travis, um, you know, he said to me, why do all this? And I said, because, you know, you get one career, you've got to make the most of your body. You know, I don't want to get fit. I don't want to get, so I don't want to get fat. I don't want to get unfit. You know, I don't, and he went, but 
you're supposed to perform on the weekend. He said, you're not, you know, you're going into games tired. You're doing all this extra stuff. Like, why are you doing it? You know, and I got up to like a, you know, 295 uh, squat, me and Tom Wood, World Cup 2011, you know, massive bench press. And he went, is it making you a better player? And I was like, uh, oh, I think so. And he was like, is it? But how does, how does shifting that amount make it any different? And I was like, okay. And then basically dismantled all those elements. And I look at how obsessive, you know, things like, you know, like I had, I'm having my own tackle bags at home, like heavy bags, in, like in a field <laughs> in, 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 in Berkshire, like in the middle of the, in the, middle of the, the thing, going out and tackling them. And, and if, I, if I sat in and that little voice in your head said, James, rest up, don't do it. That was my trigger yeah. to go, oh, but if I give in, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to uh, let me down. So I'd go and do it. I'd always have to go and do it. And you're like, you know, I'm thinking if I went on the piss, if I ever had a beer when I was younger, next day up, you know, doing fitness with my mate, me and Do me and my mate Dozer, like, you know, out like spewing because it's so fucked, thinking you could have torn muscles, you're dehydrated. But if I don't do it, I'm somehow going to fail. And uh, I honestly, and, it, and it, it, was, it was sort of around like kind of 2000, probably 2014, 15 time, where I, I felt like I played my best rugby because do you know why I wasn't, or sorry, after that slide, it was because I, I actually was resting. I was doing stuff that was helping me. Um, I'd, always, I'd always looked at the psychological side of it um, from an early age. I kind of felt that I had that kind of nail, but it was mad. The obsession was not helping me. And it's, it's interesting because your, your obsession, you know, there's like quite a few like parallels because I remember reading somewhere that you, you went on holiday with your parents or went to go on holiday, but they didn't have a gym. So they took a bench press down. Is that right? And put it on the back of a boat for you. <laughs> Yes, I, I said I wouldn't go unless there was, you know, some weights and um, I think, and I think it was like, like they had, it was like our first um, like holiday in Australia where we could actually afford to go somewhere and they'd book like, I think it was like two nights in the woods some days on this like boat and um, yeah, my poor, my poor folks, like we carted this damn bench press. <laughs> like, <laughs> And, like imagine what the what the what the boat hire people thought. Like this family with <laughs> the bench press onto the back of a boat. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? I bet your parents are very grateful you did make it to become one of the great wallabies because taking a bench press around <laughs> if you're only playing for Canberra third fifteen is, is not a great look. Um, can I ask you, David? Just could, because it happened, it happened very quickly for you, and it, it's no surprise given what you're you know, your, your dedication to it, but you, you got a pro contract at 17. You made your Wallaby debut at 20. Did you always feel to the manner born? Did you always feel very comfortable, you know, in the teams that you played in a, at a very young age? And I think I was, I was someone who never really allowed myself to celebrate the successes too much. Like mum was always reminding me like, listen, this life is a journey. You've got to, you've got to enjoy yourself along the way. Whereas I'd kind of, you know, you'd, you'd make a certain rep team and you're like, okay, well, that's, that's great. But the thing I really need to do is this. And how do I, what do I need to do to get there? And, you know, how much weight do I need to put on and get stronger and all this kind of stuff. Having said that to, to sort of play for the Wallabies and I think I played seven minutes in, our, in my first game and then to, you know, go into the change room afterwards and you look around and, you know, it's like George Smith, Matt Giddo, Nathan Sharp, all these guys that a few years ago you were at school watching with your mates and, you know, now you were there. And uh, yeah, in, in many ways, it, you know, it was a, it was a childhood dream and, and, I guess something that I was determined not to not to take for granted like, yeah. and really wanting to to make the most of, of that and kind of keep it going um, and you know to not only have just played for the Wallabies but to try and be you know a great player um, so yeah I've, I've I kind of because it's what I wanted to do since I was a kid um, getting there felt like yeah this is this is this is something I've always wanted to do and and, and sort of I know I can do it so um <laughs> let's go did was it was it everything you wanted it to be does the reality stack up with the dream well in terms of ambition I mean as a, as a again like I, I don't I don't know if I've 
said this publicly before, but you know, as a kid, I dreamed of winning the World Cup and being the best player in the world, and didn't do either of those. So, in that in that regard, like failure. Um, but you know, obviously, <laughs> there's there's um there's a lot more to it than that, and and yeah, I, I've got so many fond memories. Um, yeah, feel like I got to experience. I don't know, so many things and, you know, meet so many interesting and, and great people and, you know, travel to so many cool places um, that it really was, um, yeah, it, it, it was amazing. Um, like anything, you know, the the closer you get to it and the longer you're there for, you get to see the the other side, the sort of the ugliest side of, of, of professional sport. Um, um, you know, the, the toll it takes on your body, the number of guys that are just getting sort of churned out the bottom after a, a year or two on a contract and then they're gone. Yeah, th- that kind of tempers the, the the sort of naive childhood thing of, oh, this is just going to be the most incredible thing in the world and I'm going to sort of, you know, be famous and be paid to play rugby. Um, are you happy now, though? Are you happy now with what you did? Mm. Yeah, I feel I feel great. I, I, yeah, there's 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 the odd moment where you kind of think about I don't know a result or something that you would want to change. But I mean, in the scheme of things, it's I, I, I do I do feel I feel really happy about it because it it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so interesting to hear because. A lot of times you're a sportsman, you focus on yourself and you very rarely look at what's happening over in someone else's garden over the fence and see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. If, you, mm-hmm. I, if you imagine, so I, when I retired, I, I had similar sort of feelings to yourself. Like I, I never, I, luckily I didn't you know, ever say I was going to try to be the best player in the world because I would have fallen significantly short of that. But I had a dream of wanting to, to, to win the World Cup. And you, know, you won't say it, but you know, it appears in your career, you were the best player in the world at you know at what you were doing and that's something to be proud of you because you're uh, a humble guy and because you're always looking again you make under 20s I want to make the full team you make the full team I want to win a world cup you want to make the world cup I want to win a Challenge Nations we never look at that and you probably got you know probably everybody else was telling you the best player and you probably weren't listening because you were like well I probably could tackle a little bit better or I could have probably done a bit this bit better that's what we do but it's so interesting it's such a lesson for anybody who listens to this that nobody at the top of their game is is ultimately all fulfilled, but actually it's the recipe for success. The reason you have done what you've done is because you were never content with what you were doing, but the secret to it now in life in retirement is if you can, is to actually to sit back and take note. And, I, and I, I don't ever feel like I play rugby. I don't really, apart from kind of doing the podcast and the odd bit of commentary stuff, I don't ever feel like I played. I, 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 you know, people are very nice and complimentary and every now and then I'll see a highlight reel that someone's put up and I'm like, oh, that was cool. But I actually sit down sometimes, say, you know, over Christmas or a thing, and you think, do you know what? Like, I had a good go at that. Like, I, there were some pretty, pretty good moments. Um, and like you, I'm drawn to moments in games where I think you know, there's, a, there's a game in the, the Heineken Cup final when I came on and I made an 85 metre break, five more fucking metres, and I would have scored <laughs> the best try of my fucking career. And I fell, yeah. I fell like that far away. It really and I, has. And I wait. You, you, you've never mentioned this before. <laughs> and I, and I, fucking, <laughs> and I, I, but I think about it, and it's so funny that you're, ne- you're never content. But I just wondered now that whether it's still you're still too close to, to, to the retirement, or whether you actually every now and then, even though your attention's going on something else, you look back and go, "Do you know what? I I had a good go at that, and I'm and I'm actually happy." And you pat yourself on the back. Yeah, I have allowed myself a bit of time to to reflect, and it's interesting how. You know, often the times that you kind of really, well, certainly for me, like you, you think back on, um, fondly, I often just, you know, random little occurrences or, I don't know, little things that you did on tour with, with a few of the guys on the day off or, um, you know, some person you met out in Salta in Argentina. Um, those sorts what of a things. place what a place sold yeah. to Argentina what <laughs> yeah. a place mate <laughs> did you go to that nightclub in the back of that sushi restaurant which is unbelievable <laughs> like you think there's nothing in the middle of Salta we ordered, we ordered this sushi and there's this door you can hear this like thumping noise open the door this complete white room of just unbelievable like, amazing looking people it was, do you know what I'm talking about 
<laughs> or if you're wife's listening um, to this, you might pretend you don't, but it's fine. I'm not sure. I'm trying to... Re- I think we may have flown out, like, really early. So, they, d- yeah, we kind of went straight back to the hotel, one of those. One of those. We'll, we'll book a really early flight so no one can have, have any fun after the game. Can I, 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 got, I got a couple of questions for you. you. You've mentioned a couple of results, et cetera, that you'd love to change if you could. If you, if you could go back and tweak anything, is 2015 the obvious or are there other moments where, Jesus, I wish I'd done that differently or we'd done that differently? Yeah, 2015. I mean, that, that um, yeah, I mean, you, uh, you'd, you'd obviously want to change it. You'd want to, you'd want to win a World Cup. Um, but yeah, that, that's how it goes. And, and, and um, you know, I think when you're, playing you sometimes well certainly early on yeah you'd come up against the opposition and I don't know you'd have kind of you you didn't want you didn't want them to do well um you know you wanted to you wanted to smash them and then at some point you kind of realize that well actually when the opposition's at their best that's when I can be at, at my best. And it's actually in the opposition pushing me harder that I can become a better player. And mm. you sort of stop um, you know, death riding teams that are you know, on your side of the ladder. Or, and and you, you genuinely want teams to, to do well and to see just how well teams can play. Um, so, yeah, 2015, um, would have obviously loved to have won it. New Zealand did, and uh, yeah, on the on the day they were, they were the most they were the most deserving, and that's that's how it goes. And and the alternative is if you could open the bottle and, and drink from the elixir of top level sport. I mean, is, are there moments now which you look back on and, and think that was as good as it got? I mean, were there days that you will just remember forever? One of my favourite games for the Wallabies was in against France uh Stade de France in 20 uh, 2016 I think and um Michael Checker decided to rest a whole bunch of players uh Izzy Falau and Hoops and and, and uh, Steve Moore and a couple others and had picked like a pretty experimental team in some ways um giving a lot of guys a chance who hadn't had a chance actually you know, flying in a couple of people to play and the whole week you know the french were saying oh you know this is australia's b team they kind of they're disrespecting us we went on to sort of win a really close game and it was it was kyle godwin's um debut uh and he's a sort of a fellow zimbabwean australian and um, I got to present his jersey to him before the game. And I don't know, there was just something just so like deeply satisfying about that team who no one expected to win, I think including most Australians, you know, to beat France, you know, over there. Uh, I don't know, I remember, just remember walking off the field thinking, yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty special. I love that. I love the fact that it's not always the games that get the biggest headlines that are those that mean mm. the most to the players. Mm. Um, I mean this as a, as a compliment, but someone told me recently, Hask, actually this is a question for you more. Somebody who's very close to the England team around your generation told me that modern rugby players don't really talk about their opponents very often, but there were two people who this guy heard um, the England team talking about, one of which was Etzebeth and one of which was David Pocock in terms of the kind of players where you go, actually, bloody hell, he's pretty good at what he does. And I, I think the the, the 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 person said that the comment was that you can't move Pocock. It's like trying to wrestle with a block of concrete. I mean, do you, do you remember the attention that you had to give the man who's joined us this week when you played against him? Yeah, I mean, listen, you can't move anyone as we're doing 450 fucking crunches for 20 years. <laughs> the, bloke, the bloke's got a core like a, like a guy in Gerda. Um, no, look, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you, is that as, as a team, and you're going, the psyche of a team and where I think England teams went off the wrong in the past and other teams I work with, they spend so much time on the opposition, they forget what they 
what they've got to deliver. And, and, and really successful teams uh, are respectful and mindful, but they focus on their delivery. But there are, in my career, there have been three players that, are, well, if each team has a specific player, but the, 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 the three that I would say that stood out more than anyone were who, who would genuinely, genuinely have such an effect on the game that if they weren't managed and weren't flagged, you were in a lot of shit. And that was, that was Richie McCall for, for the All Blacks. And it was, it was David Pocock and Michael Hooper for Australia. But and, and one, my one regret in my career is that I, well, I've got a few regrets, but I never got to play against Australia that much for some reason. I never, I, I, I don't think I started to go play, but it would always be like autumn internationals. I'd, I'd, they'd end up, I think Austra we'd have Australia first, We'd end up or losing or whatever happened. Then they'd bring me in for South Africa and then I'd play in New Zealand. I'd never, wherever I went on tour, I'd always get to do it. So the tour of 2016 was the only time I ever got to consistently play. Most of my games were off the bench or I toured to Australia and I didn't get to play in it. And it was, it was a real shame. But I think one thing with, with, with playing against with, with Dave was you had to deal with him. Uh, and as I said earlier, it was made way worse when, when you had another one. You had Hooper pop up. And actually, I played against Hooper in my first game for the Highlanders. I played against... Um, I think it was the Brumbies, and he had just made his debut. And he scored like he scored two tries, got like seventy-eight turnovers. I was like, oh, "Fucking who, like, who is this person?" Um, but when we when we played for prepared for someone like David, you you had to deal with him because of how um, what influence he would have. Because you know, if you went into a, if you went into a, a tackle and didn't place the ball properly, or hesitated for a minute, or your clear out was half a second behind he'd be on and it's so difficult to shift a because not only because his size people always talk about like and, and wrongly you know because she's got big pipes doesn't mean you can be great at the ball <laughs> get your ball it looks great it looks great when you pass the ball great with your shirt off <laughs> and and i love how you were always allowed to train with your shirt off every time i took my shirt off i'll be like the lad's like put it fucking back on <laughs> you know because because you're australian you can get away with it it was just um, after sessions yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was in middle of sessions. I came out of changing without a shot. Um, but the thing with it is, is that what David had as well was, was, the, was, the, was the mobility, the center of gravity that, that made you get so low that you couldn't, get, you couldn't get him out of the way. And you'd had to be mindful of that. And as I said, you know, when in combination with, with hoops, it was a nightmare because I, as a player, when I play a lot of back row, they, when they say go head to head, what are you forgetting? It's not back row head to head. It's 15 players on 15 players. My, my job is not to follow. If, 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 if uh, David has a great game, right, and I don't have a particularly good game, it doesn't mean I, I, or, you know, I, I haven't done my job because I don't run around following someone. But the two occasions we played, you know, Eddie Jones said to me, goes, right, listen, all you've got to do is worry about those two. Don't, don't worry about anything else. Just deal with them. And that, and that, that changes the way you play. And that's the kind of thing you're actually cha physically changing the way you play. And the media would always have you believe that it's like a head on head mm. battle. But my thing is that it's not me you've got to worry about. It's my number 12 who doesn't really like going into contact, who doesn't do a clear out in the middle of the field that lets him, lets him get the ball. And I think actually, you know, there were a few players that we had to adjust. And actually, for the first time, we were, you know, we actually said in meetings, I was like, lads, we've got to change the way we're doing things here. You've, you've got to worry about these two. You can't just. Go, you know, we're all going to do our job because, frankly, not everyone is good at doing that job, and it and it and it really affected the way you 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 played. Uh, and sometimes you got it right, sometimes you didn't. But then, the beauty of it was, he would probably know that, you know, two or three is going to be a lot of heat on these first two breakdowns, which is going to then free up somebody else to have a go. And then you think, oh shit, we're going to deal with that. And then he comes into the game five or six phases later where you can't get there. And it's just it's amazing tactically. And as I said such an influential player that it, it dramatically changed the way we did things um, and was certainly a real point of focus. Fascinating. What, what was, I mean, which is a backhanded compliment in many ways. I mean, did you, did you feel I'm that short. your career? That you're short? <laughs> is that what I said? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Great centre of gravity. Mate, it's the mobility In, in summary, in summary. Yeah, in summary, no, th it's really short. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the head-to-head -head battle thing is, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a media talking point, really. And you're right. I mean, I think the, the, good, the good teams have players who you focus on, who then allow other players to shine that you maybe haven't focused on enough. And I, I think you're, you're spot on when you talk about teams who spend so much time focusing on the opposition that they actually neglect just getting their 
getting their stuff right. Um, so yeah, yeah, someone like New Zealand, um, yeah, you could focus on Richie, but they had a number of on ballers who, you know, could could punish you if your if your technique of the breakdown wasn't spot on. So you're far better off actually focusing on those core skills that week, um, ball placement, you know, working on the ground, all that stuff, rather than saying, okay, well, we're just gonna, you know, we're just gonna belt Haskell at every ruck. Yeah, that was a. You guys were on fire that 2016 tour. I um, I think I only played the first game. Of Tavita Kurandrani gave me a a boot to the eye socket. Um, but you could really. I remember, I remember in the tunnel before the game, kind of feeling, feeling really good about it. Um, I think it was Itoji was just like screaming, like yeah. just like yelling, just like, <laughs> look, I'm just thinking like looking up, saying like, mate, settle down. Like this is, <laughs> it'll happen. Like we'll get to kick off and then you can, you can do that stuff. We're in the tunnel. Um, and I mean, yeah, I think, from memory sort of Australia came out firing and then you guys clawed your way back and that was pretty much the the series you guys were on top um I've actually still got that I've still got that your jersey from it I've been meaning to no um I've been meaning to actually uh I've been wanting to auction it off at some point that's amazing to raise some money but yeah it's, it's, it's um, really nice you've even got it I thought you put it in the bin but I've kept, I've kept yours mine's at my it was upstairs, actually. In a, in have, the you, lot. have you got David's one? Yeah. We should put them together. Yeah. Put them in a frame. Yeah, I mean, because because you, you you guys got two shirts per game, wouldn't you? Is yeah. That right? yeah. Yeah. So I've got one as well. Um, so yeah, no, I was, was going to. What, what would you want to auction it off for? I put David's on, but it was a bit loose around the arms. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Alpha Jousting. What would you want to auction it off for, David? Well, at this stage, we're trying to raise some money for this project in Zimbabwe. Um, so it's called the Rangelands Restoration Trust. And it's sort of really around community conservation. And um, yeah, we're kind of trying to get it off the, off the ground um, and have someone who's offered to match donations. So kind of be a bit of a double or whatever we're actually able to, to raise. Okay, so what, what's, what's the website of your, of the trust? Rangelands Restoration Trust. Rangelands Restoration Trust. Will you put that in a jiffy bag and send it up? Yeah. And we'll get it together with the one that Hask got. We'll get it framed. Um, and let's auction it off. I, I already reckon okay, we've, be... got, we've got quite a lively front bidder. Yeah. Okay. We should we should actually bid for it ourselves for yeah. our, for a set when we when we actually have one. Um, yeah, that'd that be great. I, let's let's do it. I mean, okay. I, that would fetch a pretty penny as well. And the well, other I, thing I, I just expect, quickly want, go on. <clears throat> I don't expect James to give his one up. I've I've got I've got my other jersey, so I'll just send I'll just send both of both of the ones I've got over. That's all good. And let's get it. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll absolutely we'll smash it because people, you know, there's lots of um, people who love it. You know, we're, we're a rugby show that doesn't talk about rugby, it's about personalities, but we've got a boatload of rugby noises who absolutely love it and they will, yeah, they will be amazing. Well, and obviously I we'll think make sure Dan Leo's, good. Dan Leo was on the other day and I think okay. he's raised 1,500 quid um, from a World Cup. Search. So we should be able to get some, some good for, for a double signed. Um, from that series as well. If we put that icon, uh, we, we also ought to say thank you because there's there's one image from Hask's uh, rugby career, which you very kindly <laughs> gave to him, which basically launched a thousand ships. Yeah. Um, without, without that tackle, none of us would be here now, I think. Yeah. Uh, so we'll put that in the frame as well. But it's so true. It's like, it's like that, you know what the weirdest thing about those, that series was, it's nothing like, I, I, I still haven't watched those games back. And the, you know what the weirdest thing for me out of that whole thing was, was everybody was so nice to me. That's that's the bit that made it like really uncomfortable. Is that all the people who slated me, all the media, but everyone was being so nice. I got like so many text messages after those two tests. Everyone was like brilliant, obviously. But then I I injured my I, where my I ruptured my toe, almost ended my career in that second game playing eight, you know, playing seventy five minutes. Um, 
and actually, bizarrely, I thought I played better in the in the, in the second test than I did the, the the first test because of how physical we had to be and knew that you guys were gonna were gonna come out there. Um, but everyone was just so nice. Everybody always talks about it, but but what I keep reminding people is rest assured, David's got like ten billion images of pedigree. I've got two games and one decent. <laughs> Come one on, decent, mate. One, no, I'm, I'm underplaying it. I was fucking amazing, but I just gotta just play it down. It was a great, it was a great tackle. Um, yeah. People always say it's illegal. Get a bit of a, now. a bit of a hospital pass though. So yes, I made it a little <laughs> yeah, bit easier yeah. for you. But yeah, of course it did. Of course um, it did. Everyone, everyone you didn't miss. <laughs> Everybody watching that go. Oh, his toe was off the ground. I was like, lads. Come on, listen, let me have my one moment. He's got enough moments. He's done enough. He's talking about as one of the greatest players he's ever been. I'm known as a player with a bit of all right chat. That, that was, that's the extent of it. <laughs> it was a hell of a series, that. Um, I'm con- I mean, we could do this for so much longer. I'm conscious of, of your time, etc. cetera. Um, a, a couple of other bits and bobs, just before we, we sort of wrap it up. Um, you have been brilliant at using your platform for the benefit of others. And we, we've spoken uh, and touched on a bit of your, your conservation work, but it's not just that as well. I mean, J- Hask, you mentioned, you know, you share equal views on LGBT, et cetera. David, I know you, am I right to say you, you, you weren't going to get married until same-sex marriage was legal in Australia. Is that right? Or have I made that up? Uh, no, that, that's my, my wife and I sort of had a bit of a marriage, like a wedding in 2010, but didn't, didn't sign anything we wanted to wait till our friends sort of had that option um here in australia so we had a yeah we could sign the paperwork in 2018 um yeah it was more just a i guess a personal stand knowing people who uh you know marriage isn't for everyone <laughs> but if if someone does want to get married i think it should be an option um regardless of your your sexual orientation so uh our politicians here in australia were pretty slow in catching up with the times um but they eventually eventually got there well done can i ask just on that and i don't i don't blame you in the slightest if you flick it away but obviously there was some fairly lively headlines in the australian sporting media around one of your teammates israel Folau, which i think we touched on hask in a former life about 18 months or so ago is that a conversation you've ever had with him? Is that something you've ever discussed publicly? Is it just not not worth getting into because you've made your views clear? Oh yeah, we have we have discussed it and and yeah, I guess we disagree on disagree on and I I I think that saying those sorts of things is incredibly damaging to a lot of young people who are grappling with their sexuality and particularly when they are sort of in a um coming from a religious or sort of very christian home it it, it yeah it can be uh, yeah it can be a pretty fraught time without all this other stuff without sort of a, a, a rugby legend saying these sorts of things so um yeah we've we've talked about it we obviously disagree privately and publicly um but again, it, you know, it's one of these great things about a team sport like rugby where it's it's very hard to hate people up close. Like when you actually get to know people, you realise that we're all very complex, like pretty weird animals. And, you know, you can hold some pretty horrendous views. Um, and in other ways, you know, be a you know quite a nice person and able to you know have a chat so um yeah it's a it's a it's a hard thing to talk about these days because i don't feel like there's a lot of space in public for for learning you know we've we've moved towards this kind of cancel culture where you just get you know you're out um, for saying this one thing but i think these um things actually provide uh, a way for us to to learn together. Um, I certainly wish you hadn't have hadn't have said that stuff, um, but you, you, yeah, you hope that it's it's led to some conversations, and we can actually use it to, I don't know, progress things and make things more inclusive. Yeah, but yeah, both in rugby and in society. You, you, you I was right. You, you were captain at the time. Is that right? 
uh, when that all that happened? No, Hoops, Hoops was captain. Uh, Hoops was captain. Because I, I actually, yeah. I always wanted to ask, but it was not something we had an opportunity. Because I, I, I was very staunch about it, just purely because you know, I admire him as, if you could ask me if I could have one player's genetics to play rugby, it would be Israel Flau. If I could have a skill set, it would be Israel Flau. Absolutely I don't know how, Yeah, and, and like, you know, I, I admire him in every single thing. And, and obviously for me, I've had lots of teams with people with quite staunch religious views. I, I don't necessarily share them. Um, I think the beauty of a team sport is, and especially rugby, is it takes all shapes, sizes, creeds, colours. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's the, and we all, are, it's, it's a great leveller. And it teaches you so many life lessons about accepting diversity. And I didn't go to university. I went to, you know, all boys schools, went to boarding school. So I have a very kind of narrow perspective on life you know I had a privileged background I didn't I haven't I haven't suffered I, I have you know the the difference between you and me in terms of what you went through versus me is completely poles apart it's interesting we've there's elements of the same obsessions that comes from different different areas but with with something like that I felt the fact that it was how hard is it to be yourself let alone trying to be somebody that you're not while you know actually wanting to be true to yourself and that so many players whether you want it or not you are on a you are on a pedestal and that he, he saying what he said would just mean that some people who, who, who were so unhappy would think about doing it would, like, would go, oh, well, if he says it's wrong and he says God, and, it, and because we can't disprove or prove God, the ever, ever concerning factor is that there might actually be someone up there and you might actually get hit by a bolt of lightning or your car might blow up or something happened. So you never quite know. You could be quite staunch, but you, you never know. I just wondered how you dealt with that in a team environment because back here, because of what I said, in teams and with friends of mine, I, you know, there was, I was sort of people sort of liking other people's posts and, and, and even in my team, you know, like going to like Israel Flowers post, but not saying anything. And I was like, fucking hell lads. I thought this was like, you know, 2018 or 2019. I thought we'd all progressed past this mm. level. I know we had a lot of work to do. I just wondered how you, how you sort of managed it in that team environment. Did you all just sit down and have a meeting or did you sort of go to him direct and listen, we don't agree. I don't think you should have done that. He says, well, I did that. And then we, and we just move on. Or was it more difficult than that? Well, a lot of it happened. The first sort of part happened when I was, um, when I had a year off and was, was playing up in Japan. And then the last, the last posts were when he was with Waratahs. So, I mean, it was super rugby season and we didn't really have a lot to, um, yeah, a, a lot to do with them. Uh, I think, I don't know if you, you saw Dan Palmer wrote an article a, a mm. while ago. He played for the Brumbies and he played a, uh, a game for the Wallabies um, in 2012. Um, was he a prop? Yeah, prop. And he, he wrote such a, such a great piece about the, I guess, the, the challenge of being a gay man in that environment and sort of coming to terms with it um and and the journey of sort of feeling um that you can actually be who you are it's it's well worth it's well worth reading not, not a long um not a long piece but yeah to me that's that's kind of what i point um people to when they are sort of maybe saying like well, why why did everyone make a big fuss about it um in, in terms of the outcome, though, you know, obviously it was moved up into corner offices and decisions were taken. Did, did Israel Folau leave the door closed and that was that? I mean, did people reach out to him? People keep in contact with him or is it, it just it was literally cut and done? I'm not, I'm not actually sure of all the the details. I mean, I, I know some guys have have. Yeah, you know, kept in touch with him, and and yeah, you know, I think like like any footy team, you kind of are around thirty or have many guys um, for years, but there's probably only a handful that you really keep in touch with regularly outside of outside of rugby. So I can't give you too much there, unfortunately. Okay, um, let's not. Let's not dwell on it. I just was interested, mm. given given your your stance that you'd taken in the past. And um, the other thing is your sort of can I call it activism? I don't know. Where, where was it a mining? What was the details of where you you do you handcuff yourself to something? Well, that was much more sort of conservationism. I think is that right? This is okay. This is this is the madness that's happening in Australia. A coal mine was approved in the middle of a 
sort of state forest conservation area. And this um, particular type of woodland is critically endangered. Like, you know, 98% of it has been cut down since um, Europeans arrived in, in Australia. And, you know, of course, a coal mine gets approved. Um, so I was, you know, I was part of, I think there were over 300 people who got arrested trying to stop it. Um, and it was a combination of like local farmers, um, uh, lo local Aboriginal people, the Gomeroy, um, were trying to stop it. A whole bunch of sacred sites were, were destroyed. Uh, and so I had, a, I had a mate who was kind of quite heavily involved and was invited up there. And it just, it just seemed like madness. Like, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a climate emergency and we're busy approving coal mines in places where they definitely shouldn't be. Um, and there was a whole bunch of hints about dodgy stuff, but obviously all of it unproved. Um, so went up there and met a few of the local farmers and, you know, it was, it was really just chatting to them about the impacts of this, mine was going to have on on them and not not like there's obviously the climate side of things if we keep going the way we're going but like really immediate things around dust pollution noise pollution um the water table being lowered uh and kind of yeah got to the point where i've figured like i've been i've been saying i'm on board with all this stuff for a long time like you know signing petitions there'll be a rally in canberra i'll go down um but at some point, like you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And it just felt like a decision that I needed to make and something that I wanted to do. And, and I guess in doing that, I knew that there would be um, repercussions in rugby. Uh, I didn't know what they were, but I, I knew they wouldn't like it. Uh, but I'd kind of made peace with knowing that I would rather kind of do something that I knew was the right thing for me to do and that I needed to do um, and live with the consequences then, you know, down the track, think, Oh, I really uh, wasn't true to myself in that, in that moment. So yeah, I, I locked onto this super digger. Like it is this enormous digger. Um, and it feels like you're sort of four or five stories up on the top with a, uh, what is he like fifth generation farmer? Um, Rick Laird and we spent the day up there with a bunch of other the yeah, other people until they could um, get the police to come and cut people off that was that's what, unbelievable 14. And, and what were the repercussions because like I can't imagine many coaches would have earmarked you as like a troublemaker but what what happened you know what what, what ended up happening to you well I was I was given a, a written warning but I, I think the the bigger issue was that Australian rugby had been dealing with a few kind of play indiscretions that they hadn't really knocked on the head um, and had been lingering and there was some bad press. And, and so I, I assume what happened was when, uh, you know, I got arrested, um, they thought, okay, well, this is our chance to actually come down hard. And um, like before I was even out of lockup, before I'd been processed at the police station, they had, like put out a press release sent saying I'd been sent a letter of warning, all this kind of stuff. They knew no details about what had happened. Um, and so there was a bit of a backlash against, against them saying like, listen, you've, you've haven't, haven't been dealing with these other issues that have been going on. Now someone does this and, and sure you breaking the law is maybe not, not the right thing to do, but, um, it's potentially a little bit different. Um, so I think they copped a bit of heat, which they weren't, they weren't very happy about at the time. Having said that, check, Michael Checker had just become the coach and he, he didn't care one bit. He, uh, He's awesome. I, I had a mistake from say, I love Checker, mate. He, he yeah. wouldn't have given a shit. I, thought, I caught I up with him and he said he didn't, wasn't fast. Um, yeah. I do feel that like it's a bit like, coming down hard and you're a star student for being late once in the entire of the career as opposed to the kid is eating the glue smoking the cigarettes in the back of the class is getting away for free it's it does seem a bit odd i mean i can yeah you can see where they were coming from in, in, in their point of view 
from their point of view, I'm, I'm bringing the game into disrepute. I'm potentially pissing off a bunch of people from the big end of town who are, you know, invested in this, in, in, in fossil fuels. And yeah, you know, I think that's, that's kind of where we, where we find ourselves. I think that the, the tide has definitely turned on these issues. Everyone knows that we need to build a different economy that we, you know, the future has to be different and it can be great if we're willing to, to make the changes, but you know, there's a lot of money and sort of vested interests in politics um, from the old fossil fuel company. So I think that's what we're up against. Were you, were you happy to have basically sacrificed everything for the cause you believed in because they, they threatened that you weren't going to play for the, for the Wallabies again? I don't know if happy is the right word. I certainly, I certainly felt sort of that, uh, some sort of peace about it. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't stressing me out. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the hardest thing was, you know, being, being in a team and you do something like that, you kind of make life harder for your teammates. They're having to answer questions at a press conference. Like what's this idiot Pocock doing? Like, has he been, you know, has he been acting strange in the last couple of months? Is there some sort of underlying mental health issues that can explain <laughs> this? All this sort of stuff. So, yeah, that was that was probably the the thing that I felt bad about, and 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 um, kind of wish, in hindsight, that I would have been allowed to actually explain myself a bit more and 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 talk to the press and and um, not have my teammates do that. But um, I was kind of not allowed to uh, do media and and um, I mean you know, you know exactly what it's like. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I hope I would have, I think I would have done even if I wasn't playing rugby. So it was, it was one of those things where you go, yeah, I'm a, I'm a rugby player, but I'm also a human being and, and I really care about um, our home and, and our futures. David, this has been, um, and we've said this before, it's been the, one of the most enlightening interviews I think we've ever done. It's been absolutely fantastic really 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 interesting the sort of final question is what's next politics <laughs> uh i don't think so um you know i think politics is so important like you know <laughs> younger generations are probably you know rightly pretty pissed off and, and a bit dismayed about politicians um but someone's got to yeah, change it Yes, yeah, it's 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 so important to actually our, our share li shared lives and, and what the future can look like. Um, uh, for me, I'm kind of just following things that I'm interested in at the moment. This this range and restoration stuff feels really exciting. Um, it's yeah, it's certainly going to be a challenge, but it feels like it's something that you know it would be worth giving a crack even if it doesn't work. So there's that, and then. At some point, finish, <laughs> finish study, um, and get that done. Don't don't hurry too much. Do you want to keep a, a foot in the game? I mean, are you 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 you're doing a bit of coaching, aren't you? I mean, is or, or is that ship sailed a bit? Um, I'll do a little bit in in Western Australia with with juniors um, this this year, and then I've been talking to Zimbabwe rugby about potentially helping out there. They have almost in a way kind of relaunch they're really keen to make the next uh rugby world cup which uh, yeah would be so cool to see them in france um so yeah I'm, I'm keen to help out a bit there and they've certainly got the talent it's it's where they can keep everyone uh playing in zimbabwe amazing hask final word what an inspiring man to start the new year yeah i mean but it, it's always interesting in in sport where you get someone who's so um you know com competitive driven obviously we've, sh we've shed a bit of light on where what was his driving force what was what turned out to be recipes for success started from some pretty pretty horrific beginnings um but it's not often you meet people in sport with a deep who are deep thinker who are clearly passionate about other things that i can imagine find some turmoil like i i have some strong views but <laughs> i'm so selfish that I can easily sleep at night. Like I can, you know, I, I care about a lot of stuff. 
I care about a lot of stuff, but it doesn't, it doesn't worry me. Like with David, you get the real sense that, you know, he genuinely cares about what he's doing. He genuinely wants to make a stand for stuff. And I think it's amazing and actually goes to show how, what a good all round bloke he is. And actually made me, I said this before the show to him, my reflection, I need to look at myself a bit, but much better person. <laughs> I need to shave my lid off. I need to be a much better person. <laughs> I need to start, and I need to start doing. Four. It looks pretty good from here. Mate, it's great lighting, great lighting. I've got the blinds <laughs> coming in, it's fine. But I know, I just think it's amazing. And I think, um, as I said, he was an inspiration for me, um, you know, in, in, my, in my career, even though I'm older in terms of, you know, looking around, I think um, he's left an amazing, amazing legacy and he should be, should be very proud. And I think people the listeners of the good band of rugby will, will be blown away by kind of your honesty and openness. And um, it's very different. I don't know how you found it, but actually throughout our careers, we can never, weren't very always very uh, able to be honest uh, in yeah. the media and, feel, and express because you had to read you know toe the party line and couldn't necessarily open up and, and hopefully you, you, you've enjoyed it and found some something cathartic mm. about it in some respects yeah i mean thanks so much for having me i really enjoyed chatting yeah like someone someone that i like, after this like i'm probably going to have like this massive like oversharing hangover and be like what have i said um <laughs> but, like one, one of the people that I just love is Joe Rogan because he just says like whatever he wants to say. And I feel like you're kind of that in rugby. Like, like no, no one's, no one's wondering what you're thinking. If you know, you're just going to say it exactly how it is. And I think there's something, yeah, so important there and something that I can, I can definitely learn from it. So um, yeah, thanks for everything that you're doing. Well, I appreciate that. And I, like I said, we all get the guilt hangover. You always get imposter syndrome. Whenever I do one of these podcasts, I always wake up the next day or go to bed at night going, did I say that? Did I? And, and honest to God, you know, if you have an honest opinion and common sense dictates that what you're saying is, is fine and you believe in it and you stick to it and you can back it up, you're absolutely fine. And you haven't overshared. And I think, I think people being honest and, and actually learning more about themselves and sharing that is what's important. And the very fact that you, like I said, you know, that time you told that referee that, that one of those, I don't know if it was a South African player had made a homophobic slur. For, for me, I was like, fuck yeah. You know, there's, there's people who in sport talk a good game, but when it, where, where, where are they when the chips are down? Where are they where, when you need to be? And I think the stuff you talked about, you dealing with the, 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 the mental health aspects, but actually realizing one day that maybe the obsession wasn't good for you. There will be so many people listening to this podcast who have something in their life that's going to click and go, shit, is this that healthy? Should I speak to someone? You know, there'll be people who will listen to this podcast who, who haven't come out as, as, as gay will be going, do you know what? If these two can talk about it, it's, it's important. So you don't have, you'll always feel guilty. You always feel guilty because somebody will twist it. Mate. If you're on the good, yeah. the bad, the rugby, somebody will twist it. Someone will take what, <laughs> something I said and run with it. But I tell you what, you've been, you've been brilliant and there's nothing to fear. Yeah. It's, it's I might even need a hand trip. from one of those tanks. <laughs> yeah, it will do. But I do, do you know what the worst bit was? There's a bit where you were talking about the birds, right? The book, the bird book. Yeah, I you were about to short face. circuit at that <laughs> point. I could see your brain smoking. When you were like, I was going around the farm, ticking the birds off. The birds were flying in. Can't wait to see the birds. I was like, <laughs> oh, just stay quiet, stay quiet. But mate, it's it's uh, it's been great to have you. And there is the difference between the two of you, um, David. It's been a, it genuinely. It's been it's been a really, really, really enjoyable yarn. Thank Thanks you so much, much for for getting involved. Um, we would love to help with your auction. So it, uh, genuinely, we, I, I think we'd like to buy them in all honesty, but um, give us the website once again. Rangelandsrestoration.org. Rangers? Rangelandsrestoration.org. I can send it to Rangelandsrestoration.org. Well. We'll put that all over yeah. our thing. Um, look after yourself, and I hope everything goes we'll very, do. very well. In the next chapter. Thank you for joining us. Has Thank you to stay because we've got a couple of other bits to tell yeah, you. Yeah. David, it's been brilliant. David, thank thanks you guys and if all the best for find, lockdown. If people Sorry, want to find out what you're doing, what, what are you what, what you got social media channels that you, people can follow you and, and see a little bit more about what you're doing? Are you big on that? Oh fuck, I'm horrendous on social media, <laughs> but um <laughs> I just don't check it enough. Um in, yeah, Instagram or the our website my website even i can start putting some updates there brilliant it's been fantastic cool thank you thank you look after yourself and we'll check in again soon check on progress okay. and um we'll hope for a, a proper beer at some point in the not too distant future sounds great thanks guys have a good day thanks David. Cheers, mate. Thank see you about cheers. cheers cheers bye wow what a man <laughs> i know man i just 
It's very what rare. What have we been doing with our lives? Or at least you've got <laughs> 78 caps to your country to show for it. I'm a bit like, what? I know, it's, but it's very rare that actually, and I think it's interesting listening to his, the way he talked, that you, you sense this sort of from a few players. I think we got it from Johnny Sexton a little bit in terms of his, like, you know, could he have done more on the mental side? You know, it, it, with someone like David, you get something that he probably was so focused on what he did that he now sort of realises that the, the importance of actually the, the interactions with people and stuff. And I think, you know, to do what he's done, but also have that balance between really believing in your convictions is such a rarity because sports people are such inherently selfish. You don't often, yes, you 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 know, like I said, when I got involved with Restart, I'll put the t-shirt on, I'll take care, great, raise the money, but you don't ever look behind a curtain. Whereas someone like David has done so much, being at the top of his game, come from such an obscenely difficult background to then... Um, to make it and actually probably use his the, the effect it had on him to make it you know success out of his career is is inspirational and I think um, yeah he's, he's well, you know, what a good guy really I, I love it I was so interested and I, and also I was concerned because so many of these guys who are so dedicated who have had a lot more responsibility than I had don't often talk that much because they still have the hangover of. Is it going to be twisted by the media? What you know? Are my teammates going to have to pay for this? You know, I'm going to make it to cause more trouble. And I think he spoke really honestly and openly. And I think it was just so so interesting. And I love the fact that he's got your shirt and his shirt. And is we should we should genuinely make that auction happen. Yeah, 100 percent we should. 100% we'll follow up we should. on that. What a bloke, and what a way to start a new year as well. Hopefully that fills the positivity sails. We certainly need them for right now. Um, a couple of other bits and bobs, just to tidy up very quickly. Um, you won't have seen it. I, I've managed to cause an... I've seen it. I've seen it. Mate, the the amazing idea like... for the Lions. The amazing idea yeah. for the Lions, yeah. Um, what, what do you think? So, so for think those who brilliant. don't know it, I was bored on Sunday, and everyone's saying they're going to cancel the Lions tour, move it, or either cancel it or move it to next year, which will be a logistical nightmare to move the Lions tour to 2022. There are four tours already happening. I don't think any head coach of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland are going to want their top 40 players disappearing 12 months before a Rugby World Cup. Um, but potentially we play in full houses in, in, in South Africa. So the alternative is instead of waiting 12 months and causing us a log jam in the fixture list 12 months out from the World Cup, you move the tour from South Africa to the UK and Ireland, where we're definitely not going to have full houses, but possibly we are going to have uh, much, much fuller stadiums than we're going to be getting in South Africa this year. Uh, so I built an itinerary and I've been called everything from a COVID denier, a government apologist. Um, I've no idea what I'm talking about through to the Messiah. What a great idea. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's sort I, of, I thought it was I've excellent. forgotten how, how much I dislike Twitter and I sort of thought, Hey, this might be quite fun. Let's see what people think. Yeah. Of it. You, first first of all, you've made a mistake. First of all, you made a mistake by putting it on Twitter. Twitter is full of absolute potholes and it, and it's by far and away basically so, that Twitter is the like, the early learning center level for social media. So it means that when your grandfather and your nan has got it, it's time to move on because it means it's opened the doors to everyone. Facebook sort of after that. Instagram slightly, you know, it, it, it is a lot better in my opinion. But I read it. I thought it was really interesting. I think the most important thing is it happens and it doesn't get delayed. I think it's got nothing to do with so, COVID-19. So you, you, it has to be played this year in your view? No, no. I, well, I just think that... Um, if we could make it work by adjusting it and, and getting people over to do it, I think that's a, I think it's a great idea. I thought the structure is fine, you know, fantastic. And I think what's interesting, more so than anything else, is that you came up with a community service idea and that got adopted by the RFU. Tins' world world game plan got adopted. Now I'm not saying that this podcast is. If the, the Lions tour happens in the UK and Ireland, we should officially just declare that oh, we're yeah. running the game. Yeah, well, we're, we're like the deep state. We're like the Illuminati. But apart from we're just talking all about it in public, but no one gives us any credit. But listen, no. don't the criticism stuff says utter bollocks. I think it's really good. I think, you know, what would you rather? It, 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 it happens, um, it, you know, and it, no one's watching it. And there's no fans, which is not what the Alliance is about. Is it, yeah. better that it ha is it better that we postpone it, but then fucks everything else up? And, and the very fact that World Rugby and everything else cannot organise a piss up in a brewery to get normal stuff going with the fact you had a Lions clash and the end of the Premiership final, do you really think that they're going to be able to reorganise a tour in 2022 with um, you know, all those other tours? The answer is absolutely not. So what's the best solution? Cut your cost accordingly and do it like you suggested it. And I think around the UK would be unbelievable. I think we'd be incredible hosts. I think it would um, reinvigorate the Lions. I think it would make it much more accessible to people over here. You get kids who would potentially be able to go and watch it. There'd be the hype. Um, and if we can do it in controlled ways, that's fine. And listen, we're in, a, we're in a lockdown at the moment, but don't forget, last time the lockdown was over, we rammed pubs instead of stadiums. 
So I really don't think anyone's got any fucking leg to stand on. You know, remember we're all wearing masks yet they aren't proven to work. So I don't know. It, I think it was a great idea. I think you should be very happy with it. And even if it was, you know, even if you were bored putting stuff out on social media, I, mean, I don't know what the hell else you, you could have been doing. We really need to get you to cut the hobbies because that's some real nausea okay. stuff. I've done so much DIY over Christmas. It's embarrassing. I've vacuumed. <laughs> I've, I've, I've cleaned all the carpets. And at that point, I thought, this is it. I've had enough. I've got to find something else to do. Um, it was only an idea. It was a doodle. Um, thank you to those of you who thought it was interesting. Don't worry about it to those of you who didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, and um, tell you the other thing that we had an absolute shocker with this week was our predictions for our friends at betuk.com. Tins and I did a show last week. I don't think we've got any of them right, um, which makes for a very good weekend in the Premiership, of course, because um, who knows what on earth's happening. Um, a quick check-in on that, though. Um, we are, of course, doing a show every fortnight on our YouTube channel. For those of you who like a flutter, it's the Good, the Bad, the Rugby Premiership show, and we look ahead to the weekend's games and offer a couple of predictions. It didn't go very well last week. Um, we haven't spoken to you since you got four out of four. Yeah. Our opening weekend. Mm, Smug? You're welcome. Uh, I mean, I'm not a gambler, so I, I smug in fact that I actually got something right and the fact that I've had to put up with podcasting for years and being insulted at my lack of rugby knowledge, my lack of acumen, my lack of understanding, you know, uh, just generally all round negativity. Um, but I'm actually very pleased. I'm very proud, uh, very glad. And uh, I'm here for your, for your betting needs. Right. Quick check in on the weekend. Wasps, hello. Yeah. Uh, they they seem in the hands of the champions. Exeter. They do. They seem to be, um, you know, it seems to be a bit of uh, X's Achilles heel. At the uh, at the Rico, um, yeah. you know, coming down. Yes, I know they rested, you know, Harry Williams and um, you know a couple of the other guys, um, but actually Johnny Hill, etc. But I thought they, um, I thought Wasp did brilliantly, and I think they're unplayable at times. Um, you know, they've they carried on that progress from from last season. Um, I thought Liam Liam Supper Wunger at fullback was was fantastic. Um, you know, I think he seems to be really re reinvigorated certainly the last couple of weeks. Um, and Simon McIntyre, you know, what a, what a ball carrier. I mean, I've got a lot of time for Simon Mac, a lovely, lovely guy, ultimate team player, um, and he was at his destructive best. So I'm very excited. Is it something in a worry extra? No. Was it, you know, are you prepared to sometimes take a kick in the balls to rest some certain players to come again next time? Yes. Um, let's not get too carried away because I think Exeter are looking pretty invincible. Uh, but credit to Watson. And, and, you know, apparently also I got named as the starting six. Um, either in a program or something. Yeah, I got loads of tweets about tweets about it. So much so that Lee Blackett had to say, "Listen, you know, I thought so and so did great in the back row. It's a long time since we've uh, we've picked James Haskell at six. So there must have been an insight either on Sky or some, or well, not on Sky. Whoever was was doing it put my name somewhere as if I was playing. I thought, fucking wow. <clears throat> I could I just start invoicing for the match fee. They've they've been dusting out the archives, dusting off the archives. Some brilliant results as well for the likes of Leicester, who came back to beat Bath. Sale, winning at Gloucester, didn't pick that one coming. Carnage though, carnage. I didn't see the game. Absolute carnage. Ball boys, um, oh, no. Billy Twelve Trees. Billy pushing Twelve Trees, no. you. So aggressive, so aggressive. I, um, I mean, again, I was reading it. Uh, I, I followed this part one on Twitter. Not a great, uh, not great uh, place for a level-headed perspective, but apparently the ball boy leant over the, uh, the thing to touch the ball and stitched up, stopping Gloucester getting a a uh, quick throw in and upset everyone. Some people were like, no, mate, it just bounced into his hands. Look, from looking at it, I think it was a, a stitch up. I think the bloke reached over the, the barrier, knew what was going on, or maybe didn't, just wanted to grab the ball. But for Billy Twelteries, not sure you can go throwing ball boys around. Like, uh, you know, it's, a, it's like a punchy, I mean, it's a punchy approach. I saw Duncan Ross, was it Duncan Ross? The, um, the ex-Scotland guy did it to someone at Adams Park once and got severely told off. So I'll be interested to see how, what the punishment will be for him. Yeah, I know. Hey, hey. Um, and a quick look to this weekend, the biggie, second place Bristol against Exeter. Penny for your thoughts. Oh, look, I think it's going to be, it's going to be huge. I think Bristol, you know, they're playing some pretty special rugby. Um, you know, I saw a try the other day that wasn't to be because of uh, Semi Rodrada gave an offload and it yeah. went forward and it would have been, you know, Harlem Globetrotters. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, look, I, I will be, I will be very interesting to see. I'm going to, I'm going to tip Exeter to win just because I think, you know, Bristol rely on, on, on some, on, on getting the ball in their hands. Exeter can hold on to it for such a period of time. They'll be back to full strength. Um, but, you know, let, let, I'll see some fireworks and I would imagine that, um, 
Bristol will be so fired up to see this as kind of, you know, let's let's stop hold some momentum. Let's get Exeter losing two on the two on the bounce. We shall see. Um, quick reminder, betuk.com are offering over 14 grand's worth of prizes this season. The player with the most accrued points wins a five grand cash prize. Uh, and you can download the app exclusively on betuk.com's own app, uh, players 18 and over, as well as on iOS and Android. A quick reminder that you need to download the betuk.com app, register or log in to your betuk.com account, select the Premiership Rugby Predictor from the menu, Make your predictions of a home win, a draw, or an away win for all six of the weekend's premiership fixtures, COVID depending, obviously. Submit those predictions ahead of the weekend and hope you pick the winners. Don't forget, T's and C's apply, 18s uh, and only, begambleaware.org. Uh, have fun with that. Lots of rugby coming thick and fast, but what a, what a man to start 2021. That is it for the good, the bad, and the rugby this week. Thank you to Hask and to the incredible David Pocock. Uh, if our listeners and viewers do want to get involved, um, we will have further details on the charity um, and the auction that David mentioned in due course. We'll stick that on our socials. Don't forget the Premiership Show with BetUK.com on the YouTube channel. That'll be later in the week. We're back in seven days' time with another huge guest. We are off and running in 2021. Well done, Hoff. Anything interesting this week? No. Do you know what? It's a bit of a weird time. I haven't actually got anything I haven't got anything. I'm, st- I'm, I'm embarking. Today is the first day of the um, get the get has big uh, body transformation. Uh, I'm just right. going to go for that in a moment. Um, so I'm starting first day of that. Um, other than that, mate, not a lot to not a lot to report. Really, it's a bit of a, a bit of a sad time. I'm sort of going to try to Enjoy make it. stuff happen. Enjoy I'm going I'm to try and train the dog a bit better, but he's doing pretty well actually. Good. Love to Bert. See you next week. Take it away, Rob Bryden. Mm-hmm.